Lord be with you. Good to hear in the prayers the name Jack Myers. We pray for sympathy. That is not our Jack Myers. That's our Jack Myers' father who died um, a couple of days ago. The funeral will be Tuesday at 10 in Greenfield. Our gospel lesson today is a difficult one. It is the parable of the wicked tenants. And we'll see how that, um, what that means for us. Let's prepare our hearts for worship through the brief order of confession and forgiveness found on the third page of your bulletin. Please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the sovereign over all the earth, the wisdom from on high, our merciful judge and savior. Let us boldly approach the throne of grace, trusting in God's mercy and love. Generous and faithful God, we confess to you all the ways, known and unknown, that we reject and undermine your steadfast love. Though you made us your people, we treat strangers with suspicion. Though you forgave our debts, we collect without mercy, yet we are quick to pass judgment on others. Have mercy on us, O God, and remember your promise to us. <laughs> Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Through the living word, Jesus Christ, God forgives our every debt, our every sin, and gives you a new heart and a new spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace by greeting those around you.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit to know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. first reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. 
He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned nor hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Philippians. Paul writes, If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or have reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, 
Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his, his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They, <clears throat> they said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and this was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. The congregation may be seated, and those that are going to receive a Bible today, I want to come forward. So Dimitri is going to receive a Bible and his primary caregiver. Harold, you'll have to forgive me. I put parents in the bulletin. And I, I, I thought, should I put primary caregiver in? And I should have, shouldn't I not have? I could have said grandparents. There you go. In Christian love, you have presented this child for holy baptism and made these promises. Oh, excuse me. We haven't had a baptism yet, have we? These will be the promises that we operate under and everyone, uh, all of our children. Uh, so, Harold, I'm going to ask you to make these promises right now, to faithfully bring Dimitri to God's house to teach him the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, and to place in his hands the Holy Scriptures and to provide for his instruction in the Christian faith. Today we're specifically concerned about that third promise, to place in your child's hands the Holy Scriptures. Do you, grandparent, re make this commitment? If so, answer. I do and I ask God to help and guide me. 
And now to the congregation, do you promise to support and encourage this grandparent in keeping of his sacred promise? If so, answer, we will with God's help. One of the ways we keep the promise to place in their hands the Holy Scriptures is to give you and your child a Bible for devotions and family prayer. This is an important step in the life of Christians, and we celebrate with you today. We ask now that you, as a grandparent, fulfill the promise that, was made, that will be made in baptism. Place into your child's hands the Holy Scriptures and say, Today I fulfill the promise. I'm going to ask both Harold and Dimitri to be to kneel. Let us pray. Dear God, bless this family. Bless Dimitri. Bless his Bible to his life. Bless them with eagerness to learn that their world may grow large. Bless them with respect for your word and joy in the gospel. Watch over him and keep him safe. As he learns, help him also to discover the different gifts that you have given him to be used for your work in the world. As he hears the many voices that will fill his days, keep, help him to listen most carefully to your voice, the one that tells him that you will love him always, no matter what. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may go back to your seats. But Shannon and Jana were up here because they are the teacher for that age group. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our, um, as you can see, my, my sermon is very thin today. Uh, it doesn't mean it's going to be short. <laughs> I'm going to preface this sermon. I'm going to name this sermon, Squeezing Out the Gospel. And that comes from a quote by Martin Luther, who he says, sometimes we must squeeze the gospel, excuse me, squeeze the scripture to get the gospel out. And of course, Martin Luther was always one that wanted to get the gospel out of scripture. So he would squeeze it. He suggested you squeeze the gospel, squeeze the scripture to get the gospel out. And he said, squeeze we must. Today, I, as I prepared for the sermon, even prepared for my Bible study this week, it was um, suggested that this was not a text that people wanted to preach on. Many people could not find anything good, useful, positive to preach on. So we're going to do some squeezing today. Let's begin by uh, talking about sports. How about those Royals? Now, I realize the Cardinals are doing well, but the Royals, just think, two games they won against Los Angeles. And here you're looking at a team that they've only pay tens of millions of dollars for the players as opposed to a team 
that they pay hundreds of millions of dollars to the players. I'd say they are making good use of the gifts they have, would you not? Uh, probably the, the greatest story in sports about using gifts wisely comes all the way back to, goes all the way back to 1958 and Vince Lombardi. And if you remember, when Vince Lombardi became the coach, some of you might remember, became the coach for the Green Bay Packers. They were the worst team in the NFL. They had won one game the previous season, and they had to put up with all the loser jokes. Lombardi, though, took this team that was not much of a team, and with discipline and hard work, and he actually built a community. They really, he was able to help players genuinely care for one another, and even use the term love. We love our fellow players. And in doing so, in a few short years, when they had the first Super Bowl, the Packers won. Isn't that amazing? Then the next year, the second Super Bowl, the Packers won. Vince Lombardi was able to do with what gifts he was given. And people would joke and say he wasn't given much. But he was able to use the gifts he was given and do something almost miraculous. Well, what does that mean for us today in this text? Well, if we look, this is uh, the parable of the wicked tenants. Now, why were they wicked? Our text t talks about it. It's, a, it's actually a, a parallel. Jesus uh, used as his inspiration that passage talking about the vineyard in Isaiah chapter 5. And he tells about an owner of some land who decides he's going to build a vineyard. And he gives the tenants everything they need to, in order for them to live and have a way of life. Our text is very careful. It says, he has planted the vines. Who planted them? The owner of the vineyard. Placed a fence around it. Keeps people out and animals out put in the wine press and built a watchtower to protect it all. Who did that? The owner of the vineyard. The owner of the vineyard gave to those tenants every single thing that they needed for their way of life. For five years, those tenants did work and keep the vineyard. And after five years, the owner of the vineyard says, it's time to collect rent. It takes five years to get a crop. Uh, and all he wants is his rent. But they see the slaves come, and they beat one and kill the other. Most vineyard owners would send in the army, but instead, I'll send a few more slaves. They treat those slaves the exact same way. Our modern day equivalent to that is what happened in Guinea a couple of uh, weeks ago when eight health workers went in to uh, help with the Ebola crisis. And the villagers killed all eight. I find that hard to imagine. And it's hard to imagine what those tenants, what those wicked tenants were thinking. Except we find when the sun comes, when the owner finally doesn't send the army again, he's very patient, he sends his son. Certainly they'll listen to my son. Again, they treat him the same, lead him out of the vineyard, and outside the vineyard they kill him. Then Jesus asks, what 
just what do you think the owner of the vineyard will do now? And he gets an answer. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Now, notice, Jesus doesn't say, oh, good answer. He then, but instead, he quotes scripture. I think which really reflects the heart of God. He says, in an answer to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is, this is the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. So even the son that they rejected, God Almighty says, I'm not going to take that from you. I'm going to make him the chief cornerstone the thing that everyone, everything in God's kingdom is built upon. By the way, that's squeezing there. I hope you see that as good news, squeezing, that God isn't going to wipe out all those tenants. Instead, he's going to take the very thing they did that was evil and build something great out of it. Use Jesus as the cornerstone. That's quite a gift. Frederick Buechner says of grace, he says these words, grace is something you can never get, but it only can be given. There's no way to deserve it any more than you can deserve the taste of raspberries and cream or bring about your own birth. A good sleep is grace, and so are good dreams. Most tears our grace, the smell of rain, is grace. Someone loving you, someone loving you, is grace. Well, in case you've heard me say this, and I, I find it interesting that whenever I say this, someone gets upset. I don't mind, but I'll say it again. Everything you own was given to you, was given to you by God. You only think you own it. God owns it. You are just the steward. What are you doing with God's stuff? Everything you own belongs to God. If you don't believe me, I, I, I mean, it's interesting. I never have found anyone on their deathbed say, oh, no, what's going to happen to all my stuff? That's the farthest thing from their minds. Whatever happens, they really don't care at that point. Why? Because everyone on their deathbed realizes they do not own it. So, what are you doing with God's stuff? God gives us gifts to further and build his kingdom. I read a little quotation from um, the life of, uh, it was written in a sermon in Shaking the Foundations, uh, written by Paul Tillich. And he happened to comment on, when he was young, Paul Tillich was raised a Lutheran in Germany, when he was young he was asked to write, to, to share a Bible verse that was sort of a Bible verse that was sort of a, a keystone in his life for his confirmation verse. And the verse he picked was the verse by Jesus where he said, Come to me, 
all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And people looked at him and said, you picked that verse? And he said he was a little embarrassed by it. But he said, even in his embarrassment, he knew it was the right verse. He said that he doesn't know why, but it just is something that resonated with him. And he said, as he grew older, he would go back to that verse and realize time and time again it was something that reflected his life and gave him strength. Tillich, great theologian, was one who understood the gift of the gospel and what a treasure it is. One of God's many treasures that he gives us to build up our lives. And he asks us, use them wisely to build God's kingdom. Amen. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Was crucified, died, ascended to the
With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Sing a love song to us, O God, with verses that rouse us to be the church in a world where faith is met with cynicism. Help us to be good stewards of your grace as we bear fruit for your kingdom. Hear us, O God. Sing a love song to us, O God, with verses that motivate us to, with your help, to build a better world. We lift up the people of Texas treating an Ebola patient, as well as those in Nigeria, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. For the people of California with no respite from the drought, for the people of Hong Kong and their quest for freedom of choice and leadership, for the people of the Middle East as they battle forward in the conflict with ISIS, for the people of Japan as the death toll following the unexpected er eruption of Mount Antaki rises. Hear us, O God. Sing a love song to us, O God, with verses that promote your kingdom among us. Help us to work for change where there is injustice, freedom where there is captivity, and harmony where there is violence. Hear us, O God. Sing a love song to us, O God, with verses that compel us to provide relief to those who suffer. Remember those who need your healing presence, especially Alton Burnell, Linda Demery, Zach Drake, Wilbert Dykeman, Samir Godfrey, Bonnie Holcomb, Jim Lampy, Elaine Mitchell, Wayne Myers, Suzanne No, Paul Olin, Kathy Roblin, Gina Roughton, Katie Snaff, Mary Thomas, and Ramona Vaughn. Are there any others? Sing a love song to us, O God, with verses that assure us of eternal life, where together with all your saints, we will join you in a song that has no end. Comfort those who mourn, especially the family and friends of Mildred Belko, Harry Kirkpatrick, and Jack Myers. Hear us, O God. Trusting in your mercy and goodness, we bring before you these prayers and whatever else you see that we need in the name of the one who sets us free, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
merciful God, as grains of wheat upon the hills were gathered together to become one bread, so let your church be gathered to the earth into your kingdom, for yours is the glory. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the heart. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All is ready. Our Lord invites us. Please come. You may be seated.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. O God, the host of every meal, at this table you spread out a feast for all peoples, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Send us from this banquet to invite others into these good things, to let justice roll down like waters, and to care for the least of our sisters and brothers. Through Jesus Christ, our Sovereign and our Savior. Amen. I'm going to encourage you to, um, to read your messenger. There is a sign-up sheet for, um, for, the, for Trunk or Treat. So if you want to have a car here, um, we, we need cars. That um, You can be modest with your trunk or you can be It's up to you. <laughs> anyway, re read about it. Also, you heard in our, our prayers, um, Mildred um, Belko, which is David Zavecki's aunt. She passed away also. Uh, so you might want to um, share your sympathy with Dave. I encourage you to uh, shake hands with at least three people you don't normally sit, shake hands with, and if you don't know them, better yet, receive this benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace that sustains every breath we take, the love of God that gives us courage and strength, and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit that fills our hearts with comfort and peace be with you and all those you care about, now and forever. Amen. Guided by the gospel, we welcome Go in peace.
Christ is with you. Thanks be to God. 